Hello and welcome to DM It All, the show where we discuss D&D books and tabletop gaming history. In this episode, we're going to discuss Vecna, arguably the most famous lich in D&D history. Its biggest competitor is probably a Sererak, the cruel creator of the Tomb of Horrors, and according to Greyhawk lore, Vecna's own apprentice. The original Big Bad Lich was created by Brian Bloom, one of the founding partners behind D&D's original publisher, TSR. Bloom was a tool and die maker that met Gary Gygax at the Gen Con game convention in the early 70s. Bloom's extra funding was crucial in getting TSR off the ground, and he would go on to author several products for the company. One noteworthy example is Eldritch Wizardry from 1976. This was the third supplement for original D&D, and it featured the first appearance of Vecna, or at least Vecna's mummified hand and cat-like eye. You see, Vecna was originally a pair of magic items with some minor backstory. The hand and eye of Vecna once belonged to an undead sorcerer so powerful that his dark magic survived within his foul remains. Vecna himself was assumed to be long dead, amounting to little more than a mythological figure in D&D's early years. Vecna's name is an anagram based on Jack Vance, the fantasy author who inspired D&D's magic system. Vecna's artifacts, however, are believed to be an homage to the Eternal Champion novels by Michael Moorcock. The Swords trilogy within this series featured the Eye of Rin and the Hand of Quill. Prince Coram, the protagonist of the trilogy, used these artifacts to replace his own missing eye and hand. These granted him great strength, as well as the power to peer into a purgatory-like dimension and pull out undead creatures. These creatures could kill Coram's targets, who would then fill the undead vacancy in purgatory, meaning Coram's enemies would soon find themselves as his unwitting allies. The hand and eye of Vecna don't operate the same way, but rather grant dark powers to anyone missing an eye or hand, or anyone willing to lob off those body parts in exchange for power. This led to some DMs setting up a prank within their campaign called the Head of Vecna. Power-hungry characters would seek to swap their own head with Vecna's in order to gain the Lich's terrible power. But the Head of Vecna was never a real artifact, leading to some gleefully pointless decapitations. The abilities granted by the real Vecna artifacts differ from campaign to campaign. Powerful D&D artifacts were usually left to be customized by the DM, following a few set rules. This was so that only the Dungeon Master would know how these magic items functioned, even if players read about the artifacts beforehand. Each item typically had a set amount of suggested powers and uses. For example, the Hand of Vecna has thrice as many suggested spells than the Eye. The DM was also encouraged to provide their own unique abilities, granting powers typically unavailable to players. Even the suggested powers could grant players a poison touch or an immunity to all metal. While D&D artifacts could be quite powerful, they came with drawbacks. As a universal rule, artifacts drove their owners to become very possessive of them and were fairly difficult to destroy. Artifacts also had suggested drawbacks to using them that DM could customize. These side effects range from minor stat reductions to flat-out death. Other objects needed certain conditions to be met for them to be usable. For example, a holy object might require the owner to embark upon a holy quest. Vecna's dark appendages naturally had their own drawbacks, some of which were universal to every campaign. Regardless of what other abilities they were imbued with, Vecna's artifacts would not only fuse with their owners over time, but also turn them evil. Both of these effects were permanent and irrevocable, as not even the gods themselves could undo this woeful transformation. Another magical item listed in this booklet is the Sword of Cass. Cass being Vecna's purported bodyguard. This sword grants its user various powers, but similarly corrupts any who dare wield it. In 1979, Gary Gygax updated the Sword of Cass and Vecna's artifacts for the Advanced D&D Dungeon Master's Guide. This book established that Cass had betrayed Vecna, with the two destroying one another during their final battle. It also revealed that the Sword of Cass possessed an intellect of its own, as it convinced Cass to turn on Vecna, which is ironic given that Vecna was the one to give Cass the blade. In 1989, the second edition of the Dungeon Master's Guide would further detail Vecna's history, it established the Great Evil as a historical figure, explaining that his hand was found 136 years after his passing. Also detailed were the various owners of the hand after it was discovered. At one point the hand was found by a random fisherman. This fisherman was eventually murdered by his brother who coveted the artifact. The brother was in turn slain by a random outlaw who went on to have a hundred year reign as Vecna II. So the hand didn't merely turn people evil. Vecna's lingering essence convinced the owners that they were Vecna Reborn. 
The lead designer of 2nd edition AD&D was David Zeb Cook, a prolific D&D designer back in the day. On top of his work for 2nd edition, Zeb Cook also created the Planescape setting, as well as several iconic adventures such as the Isle of Dread and the Dwellers of the Forbidden City. Zeb Cook was a wargamer who learned about D&D through his university's gaming club. He later responded to a Dragon magazine ad to become TSR's third full-time designer. The name Zeb came from his time as a high school teacher. His students thought he looked similar to Zeb McCahan from the 1976 TV show, How the West Was Won. In 1990, Zeb Cook would go on to create a 96-page adventure about Vecna. Despite being a staple in D&D for over a decade, this marked Vecna's first appearance as a character in the ominously titled Vecna Lives. As usual, there will be spoilers in this module walkthrough. If you want to skip ahead to our final thoughts, jump ahead to the time shown here. Vecna Lives opens with the clarification that it's an adventure meant to kill player characters. The module claims the constant threat of death is important, because the adventure is supposed to play out like a horror movie. Note that as a high-level campaign, it's meant for characters around level 13, which would mean cherished veteran adventurers players have sunk a lot of time into. This is partially why the module pushes players into using pre-generated characters. The other reason is the identity of said characters, given that this module takes place in Greyhawk. Greyhawk was created by D&D co-creator Gary Gygax when he was playtesting the D&D rules. Players undertaking this adventure are given the chance to play as the Circle of Eight, the most famous characters from the setting. Even players not familiar with Greyhawk might recognize names like Tensor, Nystal, Odaluke, Bigby, Otto, Rary, and Drawmage. Many of the named spells in D&D originate from their creators in the Circle of Eight. The only member without a famous spell is Jalarzy Salivarian, given that she is a newer member created for 2nd edition. Most of the other members were originally played by Gygax's friends during the Greyhawk playtest. This was where the Circle of Eight, a secret organization meant to protect the realm from dangerous threats, was first conceived. If the players follow the module's suggestion, there'll be a high-level party composed almost entirely of wizards. Stranger still, the party starts this adventure smack dab in the middle of nowhere, within a secluded mountain range. The party stands before a burial mound, and there isn't much they can do besides investigate. All they know is they've been sent here by Morden Kanan, the leader of the Circle of Eight. Morden Kanan was Gygax's character from Greyhawk playtests, and to this day he is a recurring figure in modern D&D adventures, although Wizards of the Coast made him totally bald for some reason. According to this module's backstory, Morden Kanan sensed danger coming from this burial mound, which was somehow preventing divinations into the future. This was so ominous that Morden Kanan was forced to send the Circle of Eight. Note that it wasn't ominous enough for Morden Kanan to go in person, as he is absent during this opening sequence. The mound features a decrepit stone entryway leading to an unstable dirt tunnel. Inside is a magical aura that buffs the party but also blocks any teleportation. The party will quickly come across a large stone seal that blocks their passage. Inscriptions upon the stone explain that the seal is meant to ward off evil. The party has to, unfortunately, break the seal at this point, as there is no other way to progress. Once they do so, they will make their way through a mini-dungeon with around four rooms total. One room features a fight with some fire toads, while an insect-like Ankhag tries to grab any distracted characters. The main tunnel features a magical cage trap, as well as a pit with an ooze monster at the bottom. While threatening, a competent party should have no problem traversing this area, thanks to their high-level wizards. In the sixth room within this dungeon, the party will find another, much stronger seal. Past this seal is a large room containing decrepit furniture and an elaborate sarcophagus. The shriveled creature within the sarcophagus will introduce himself as Vecna, before immediately attacking. Vecna opens the fight by casting a time-stopping spell and then killing multiple characters all before the party can even move. Anyone still alive will be barraged with spells and swarmed by summoned monsters. The DM is given free reign to cheat here, allowing Vecna to always go first as well as automatically resist any spells. That's because the Circle of Eight is meant to die here, and the DM needs to ensure that this happens. 
This scripted scenario acts as a way to heighten Vecna's threat, demonstrating how easily he can rip through the most powerful heroes in all of Greyhawk. The players at this point will be handed new character sheets as they switch over to their real characters, the ones they'll be playing for the majority of this adventure. These are the close associates of the Circle of Eight, left to investigate their grisly murder. While the module provides its own fleshed out new characters, players are free to use their own at this point. However, it is important that they have some connection to the Circle of Eight. Our story begins, uh, again, with a vision. The new characters witness vague images of the Circle of Eight in their final moments. The dying wizards manage to impart a final message to the party. Warn Morden Kanan. The party starts in the free city of Greyhawk, a massive city-state and one of the major points of interest within the entire realm. All the party can really do at this point is gather information about Morden Kanan. To find the man, they will have to visit the local wizards guild and hopefully have at least one wizard on their team. If they do, one of the guild members will be willing to arrange a meeting with Morden Kanan in a nearby tavern. Morden Kanan will not appear in person though, and will instead talk through a magical apparition. The head wizard doesn't provide much new information, as he mostly talks down to the party. The most he reveals is that an astrological alignment is occurring, and has something to do with Vecna's hand and eye. Morden Kanan claims he is busy researching the matter, and leaves it up to the party to investigate the murder of his comrades. Note that this is the only real appearance of Morden Kanan within this adventure. Stories like these are always considered a bit of a jerk. Eventually, the party will be interrupted by 18 Vecna cultists swarming the tavern. Their allegiance will be obvious, given that two members are based on Vecna's hand and eye. We mean this literally, where the minions' head should be is a giant eye for one and a hand for the other. The eye enemy mostly observes and gathers information, though it can suck the soul of a character should they fail a saving throw. Killing the eye will allow the soul to return to its proper body. Whereas the eye acts as an aloof supervisor, the same cannot be said for the hand, a quasi-bestral creature controlled through magical torture. It acts as the muscle of the group, and its strength is equivalent to a giant's. This figure can use its hand slash head to grab and slowly crush the life out of a victim. Any character grabbed this way will lose 1d strength per round until they kill the hand or the hand kills them. Aside from these monstrosities, the party will also have to deal with Vecna's heart, teeth, fingers, and various other body parts. As fun as that sounds, these are just different ranks within the Vecna cult, as they're all normal people, or as normal as a cultist can be. After the fight, the party has a bit more freedom in performing their investigation. The player characters can go back to the Wizard Guild, or they can check out the local libraries, temples, and seedy dives to gather more information. The best place to learn this module's backstory is through the Library of Greyhawk. Depending on what books they read, the party can learn about Vecna, as well as a man called Halmadar the Cruel. Halmadar was the last known owner of Vecna's hand and eye, and he was buried in the Kron Hills, the same mountain range where the eight met their demise. It's here that the local gnomes encountered a mysterious group of humans. The humans hired the gnomes to build a special tomb that could keep its inhabitants trapped within. Once their job was completed, the gnomes were forced to swear a vow of secrecy as to the location of the special tomb. If the party is clever, they might piece together that the opening confrontation wasn't with Vecna, but rather Halmadar believing himself to be Vecna due to the artifacts, a plot point to keep in mind. At the local temples, the party can inquire as to the whereabouts of the Vecna cult, and they'll be directed towards the seedy river quarter. Here they'll come across a Romani-like tribe known as the Rini. The Rini are presented as a somewhat honorable clan, despite the majority of them also being thieves. They're a nomadic group that travels up and down the local rivers without ever settling on the shore. The Rini have a clear hatred of Vecna's symbols, but they don't trust people outside their clan. The party will likely have to make nice with at least one member of the clan, as the Rini are the only ones able to reach the Kron Hills. No one else in this massive city is apparently familiar with the location, and the party will probably get lost if they venture out on their own. This serves as a way for the party to run into Turum, a peg-legged old man from the Rini tribe. Turum informs the party that Vecna's cult has a temple in Verbabank, a city near the Kron Hills. Turum will also insist they come with the player characters, and will follow them regardless of their decision. He claims to seek vengeance on the cult for infiltrating the Rini and dishonoring his people. To validate this, the party can actually sniff out cultists from within the Rini and have them publicly executed by the tribe once exposed. However, the party shouldn't waste too much time during their investigation, as this adventure is on a timer. The mysterious astrological alignment behind the divination block 
will eventually cause clerics to lose contact with their deities, making their spells take longer to prepare, with an ever-increasing rate of failure. If this adventure is meant to inspire fear, the party will definitely start to sweat as they gradually lose their valuable healing and resurrection magic. Eventually, the party will take a Rene barge to reach the Kron Hills. The module has unique random encounters for this river trip, as well as scripted encounters depending on which boat they hire. Whereas evil cultists have infiltrated most of the boats, Turim's vessel is secretly being operated by river trolls. These river trolls have been polymorphed to look like Rene tribesmen, and will attack the party if they get too nosy during the voyage. Turim will try to stop any fights that break out, given that he's, as you could guess, a secret villain that has plans for the party. Upon reaching Verbobank, the party will discover that it's not quite as welcoming as the city of Greyhawk. The Verbobank citizenry is obsessed with class and rank, while their rulers are overzealous about security. The leaders of Verbobank are naturally very suspicious of cult-like organizations, given that this is the same town that fought against the Temple of Elemental Evil in one of the most famous D&D modules from the Greyhawk setting. Therefore, if the party is a bit too brazen in their inquiries, it can be a bit of a problem. Should they go around asking about the cult of Vecna, the city guard will push to be part of the investigation. The city officials will also be more than happy to torture the party if they are insufficiently respectful or cooperative. Asking around will also put the party in danger of the first subplot, the cult of Vecna itself. The cult will not attack the party within Verbobank, but instead propagate false leads to lure them outside the city walls. They specifically lead the party to an abandoned mining quarry nearby, spreading rumors of strange ritual killings. They will go as far as staging a fake ritual during the middle of the night, complete with scarecrows, torches, and blood splatterings to set the scene. If the party goes to investigate, they will become prey for the vampiric mists. These gaseous bloodsuckers are the reason why the mine was abandoned in the first place. While the mists won't be too much of a problem for a high-level party with magical weapons, the Vecna cultists nearby will pose more of a serious threat. After the party survives the mists, they're rushed by five fighters backed up by three wizards sniping from afar. There are also two thieves waiting to backstab anyone who dares reach the spellcasters. If the party emerges victorious, they can interrogate remaining cultists to learn which tavern serves as their base of operations. The heroes will then be able to recruit 21 fighters and four clerics from the city of Verbabank to perform a raid on the cultist headquarters. Our old absent pal Turum reappears around this point, and will once again follow the party regardless of their wishes. In the cellar of the tavern, the party will discover a secret temple area with an altar. Within are numerous cultists praising quote-unquote Vecna, who the party may actually know to be Halmadar the Cruel. As soon as the party is discovered, combat will begin. However, this is yet another scripted battle meant to set up a dramatic plot twist. Just as the encounter is set to conclude with either the party's victory or defeat, Turum steps forward, causing the cultists to quiver in fear. Turum will approach Halmadar and rip out his hand and eye, turning the imposter to dust. Turum will announce himself as the one true Vecna, thanking the party for their help and promising to reward them at a place called Tovag Baragu. He then teleports away. Through research, the party can learn that Tovag Baragu is located within the Dry Steppes Desert. It is marked by massive stone blocks arranged in circular patterns. Think of it as the Greyhawk equivalent of Stonehenge. No one knows the purpose behind Tovag Baragu, but it supposedly allows people to view and teleport to distant lands. Note that the battle between Turim and Halmadar plays out regardless of the party's investigation, or even if they're around to witness it. Should the party ignore the cult of Vecna, they'll hear about this confrontation through word of mouth around town. Which might just happen if the heroes decide to investigate the second subplot, Halmadar's Tomb. The best way to do this is to ask the gnomes in Verbabank for information regarding the tomb. The gnomes will regale the party of the legend of Osnabrolt, the local gnome village that built Halmadar's tomb, but is better known for its sacred treasure. It turns out that long ago, a strange gaunt man with one hand and one eye came to Osnabrolt. He ate dinner with the gnomes, and then challenged them all to a wrestling match. After besting them, he thrusted a sword deep into the floor of their great hall. 
As a payment for its victory, the gnomes were tasked to watch over the sword from that point onward. Ever since then, though crops and craftsmen were cursed with everlasting failure, the warriors of Osnabrolt went on to become the finest in the land. If the party ventures towards Osnabrolt, they'll find the gnome tunnels are in ruins. Rumor is that a human passed through town recently and wreaked devastation to all their underground dwellings. Because of this, the gnomes will be hesitant to aid any humans in the party. If the party asks after Halmadar's tomb, there's actually no way to learn of its location according to the module. Although a lot of this module is spent investigating the Circle of Eight and retracing their footsteps, the party never actually comes across their corpses. The Circle eventually gets resurrected according to Greyhawk lore, but that occurs after the events that transpire here. The gnomes may never trust the party enough to lead them to the tomb, but they are open to directing the party towards the town's sacred treasure. The gnomes will hand over the curious sword from their former Great Hall if and only if the heroes prove they are worthy of it. Thus, the party must undergo a brutal ritual, beginning with a day of fasting and frequent bathing in order to cleanse their bodies. The heroes must then spend the next day in a brutally hot sauna that will require the characters to pass multiple saving throws. Any character that survives the sauna will likely start hallucinating incoherent visions at this point. This is to make the party question reality as they're finally brought before the sword. Those familiar with Vecna might piece together that this blade is in fact the powerful Sword of Cass, a realization they'll be keenly aware of once the one who grabs it suffers 2d20 of damage. The wielder of the sword is then not only aware of Vecna's general location, but also becomes obsessed with hunting the Lich down. The character will develop a bloodlust that must be satiated, whether it be by foe or friend. To make matters worse, they'll slowly become possessive of the blade, developing an unhealthy paranoia of everyone around them. The gnomes, however, will be oblivious to these dreadful tidings, instead rejoicing that the sword has finally found a worthy owner. When they hold a feast to celebrate, it will be interrupted by a new group of cultists. These are members of the Cult of Ayus, Greyhawk's god of evil. Ayus the Old One is a deity that resides not in the heavens, but in the lands of Greyhawk, maintaining a cruel rule over his dark empire. The party will probably have learned of the cult of Ayus by now, as they were once the dominant cult in the region, until they were purged from the city of Greyhawk. The cultists are here to steal the Sword of Kaz and run away once they have it. Should the party capture the leader, he will offer aid in their quest to stop Vecna. The leader fears that Vecna's rise to power will make him a threat to Ayus, and he vows to never hurt the party again until Vecna is defeated. This questionable team-up is an interesting idea, except that there's no reason for the party to believe that a priest with a zeal for evil maintains any code of honor. With the Sword of Kaz in tow, the party will probably feel more confident venturing towards Tovag Baragu. Smart characters will avoid traveling by foot, given that the trip would take over 40 days. This adventure provides an overland map and some vague encounter ideas, but it does not supply any notes for what they entail. It doesn't even offer any tables for unique random encounters. The module instead recommends that you combine it with other books from the Greyhawk setting, as there are sections like this that need some extra material. Once the heroes get close to Tovag Baragu, they'll spot the local barbarians gathering around a stone monument. These barbarians are watching intently as Turim performs some kind of ritual within the landmark. Note that while Vecna never appears in his true form during this adventure, Turim is the next closest thing. That's because Vecna discovered a way to ascend to godhood, and thus created Turim to be his avatar. In 2nd edition, a lot of deities stopped appearing in the physical world opting to act through weaker puppet manifestations called avatars. There were still some corporeal deities like Ayus, but these generally stopped being the norm during 2nd edition. This change was done so that player characters could still fight deities without killing them in their official canon. If a player character ever did manage to slay a deity, surprise! It was just their avatar, not the deity itself. Not that it matters here, since it's very unlikely the party will even be able to kill Vecna's avatar. Turum is a level 20 caster with 70% spell immunity and a paralyzing touch. If the party thinks the Sword of Kaz is the key to defeating Vecna, they'll quickly realize they're wrong. Although Kaz may have slain Vecna, it was not by using his sword. 
In fact, Vecna made sure the weapon could not be turned against him, sapping it of all of its magical abilities while in his presence. Luckily for the players, Vecna would rather talk than fight. If the party still tries to battle him, he will seek to subdue rather than kill. The Lich is rather impressed with the party, and wants one of them to become his new right hand. But only one person can have the position, and they must prove their loyalty by murdering their friends. If someone agrees to the plan, this will end the campaign pretty quickly. Should the party unanimously refuse, Vecna will throw them through one of the portals within Tovag Baragu. It turns out that the archways here serve as portals to other dimensions and other periods of time. The ritual Vecna is performing is one to open a time portal to his former empire. He seeks to bring his followers from that period into the present in order to increase his status as a god. Seeing as deities gain power from their followers, if Vecna succeeds in resurrecting his empire, it will make him the most powerful deity in all of Greyhawk. He'll actually explain his entire plan to the party through a classic expository villain monologue. After the party is thrown through the portal, they will arrive in a location similar to Tovag Baragu. This place, however, is covered in ash, awash in a gray haze that obscures everything. The only thing visible off in the distance is a massive structure that looks like a human skull with the cranium sliced away. If the party ventures too far away from this structure, they will pass through a force field. Beyond is the elemental plane of ash, where no living creature can survive its atmosphere. The party is effectively trapped and they will have no choice but to venture towards the skull structure. Near the entrance, the heroes will be greeted by a doorman, who will write down their names as well as their crimes against Vecna. This structure is called the Citadel Cavidius, and it is a custom hell devised by Vecna himself. Instead of killing his enemies, Vecna dooms them to eternal life within this gloomy dimension. Here the party will find hundreds of random people wandering around in a mindless daze, the color and life drained out of them, with many driven to madness. Undead creatures also wander the halls, but they don't even bother feasting upon the living. That's because this place is on the border between the elemental plane of ash and the negative energy plane. Negative energy is the life force of undead creatures, so the undead are basically at an eternal banquet, supplied with constant sustenance in the area. The Citadel Cavidius is a huge location, but there is unfortunately not much detail to it. All the party can really do here is simply talk to five NPCs wandering the area. The sane denizens will claim that escape is impossible, but that's not exactly true. The party can still use dimensional teleportation, and they can just open the portal they were tossed through to get here. But the player characters will still need a way to defeat Vecna, which means they must find the one man who successfully bested Vecna in the past, Kaz, his former bodyguard. The Sword of Kaz will inform its current owner that Kaz is within the Citadel, lurking inside one of the oldest sections of the prison. He now lives on as a vampire after being exposed to the negative energy plane for too long. The Citadel is too dense and chaotically designed to be navigated alone, so the party will have to ask some prisoners as to Kaz's whereabouts. This can lead to some combat encounters, however, as several prisoners have been driven violently mad. Upon reaching Kaz, the party can reveal that they possess his sword, to which he'll demand they return. If they do so, Kaz will use it to just teleport away, leaving the storyline for good. Yes, not only is Kaz a punk, but the sword has innate teleportation abilities, something Vecna would have known about yet lets the party hold on to despite having condemned them to prison forever. Should the party want help from Kaz, they must instead ignore his requests and do what a D&D group does best, threaten him. Kaz will reveal that he defeated Vecna by throwing him into the Outer Plains. Vecna's evil magic kept him alive while men in the Mortal Plane began to develop a cult around him. Eventually, Vecna got enough followers to become the demigod of Black Secrets. So the only hope now is to find another god to defeat Vecna. Since every Greyhawk cleric has lost contact with their deity, the heroes must call upon the only known god still residing within the physical world, Ayus, the god of evil. When the party returns to Tovag Baragu, they will have to call upon Ayus for help. If they pray to their own deities, they'll be told that Ayus is the only one that can save them now. If the party refuses to summon the god of evil, Ayus will show up anyway, as he is in the process of looking for Vecna himself. The DM is expected to narrate the battle between Ayus and Vecna in a dramatic way, instead of playing it out like standard combat. Actual D&D wizard fights are usually boring to watch, proven by the time stop battle from the beginning of this adventure. Ayus starts out with the advantage in this fight, since he is a god in physical form, whereas Vecna merely has an avatar. But the Ayus advantage will diminish, as Vecna's psychophants start pouring through the time portal. 
it is up to the party to kill Vecna's followers in order to ensure that Ayus maintains the upper hand. This is a creative way to keep the party involved despite being massively outclassed by these two deities. At least it would be if not for the fact that Ayus can destroy the time portal whenever he pleases. In fact, Ayus will do exactly that just as the party becomes overwhelmed by Vecna's forces. The destruction of the portal will then cause Tovag Baraku to glitch out and spawn random portals everywhere. While this effectively ends Vecna's evil plans, he and Ayus remain in ever-present danger to the party. To prevent any future retaliation, the party needs to grapple with the two deities and push them through one of the random portals. If the party succeeds, Tovag Baragu will be broken for good. The archways continue to generate portals, but these will spew forth fire at random intervals. One portal will also spew out Vecna's hand and eye, though the party will never actually notice this happening. Afterwards, the party is rewarded by their deities in the form of a unique skill or stat boost. It turns out Vecna's plan was to create a mystical web around the world to cut off all clerics from their gods. This would not only have elevated Vecna to a greater deity, but the only one connected to his followers within the setting. It would have made him powerful enough to shape the realm as he pleased, if only it wasn't for those meddling adventurers. This module is notorious for its opening sequence, and rightfully so. First off, it's a clunky setup, requiring everyone to learn a bunch of complicated characters just to kill them off in an hour or two. More importantly, since the adventure hinges on the party dying, none of their actions, arguments, or decisions really matter. Given that the DM is allowed to cheat in order to make this happen, this entire sequence might have been better served as a cutscene, especially because the main characters of this adventure only receive a hazy vision of the opening scenario anyway. Playing the opening puts the players 10 steps ahead of their actual characters, which can be frustrating given the investigatory element of this module. The party is made to retrace the steps of the Circle of Eight, despite having just played as them, so they spend arguably too much time relearning things they already know. Aside from that major flaw, the actual investigation is probably the most well-done aspect of this adventure. While most of the action sequences are heavily scripted, the party is given remarkable freedom in how they carry out their investigation. There are many different ways to gather clues, and the party can even run into some optional encounters not relevant to the plot. A decent amount of irrelevant information is provided, adding a lot of flavor to the world and enhancing the party's potential social interactions. For example, if the party visits the zealous Church of St. Cuthbert, the priests will try to convert the party in exchange for providing them information. They'll even attempt to bonk the party members with the cudgel, as is the Cuthbertian tradition. The investigation is still somewhat railroady, however, as the party will inevitably solve the mystery no matter how much they fool around. If the party gets stuck, the DM is recommended to feed the characters directions as to where to go. For example, if the party skips the Sword of Cass, they will receive a dream vision telling them to go to Osnabrold. This is despite the fact that the Sword of Cass is not even mandatory for finishing this adventure. While it's important to keep the momentum up during an investigation, we feel the mystery loses its luster if it requires no effort to solve. Players might even notice that all their actions come secondary to the very scripted and unalterable plot events. This brings us to the finale of this adventure, which is almost as linear as its introduction, barring the right-hand man betrayal. It's hard not to see this as a missed opportunity. Just because the party is outclassed in a direct fight against Vecna doesn't mean they couldn't figure out how to interfere more directly with his plans. For example, Vecna's ritual at the end is powered by seven magical artifacts scattered throughout the world, yet the party is never allowed to interfere with or even find these magical MacGuffins. Seeing as Tovag Baragu is a gateway between different dimensions and time periods, you'd think the party would have more options for sabotage in the finale. For an area touting endless possibilities, Tovag Baragu is not nearly as boundless as it appears. The progression from the hero's arrival here to the final fight is only 10 pages worth of content too, making the entire final act shorter than either of the module's city chapters. Lastly, the Citadel Cavidius is also a missed opportunity. Since it has a great concept but does startlingly little with it aside from a vague description of the layout and a few scripted encounters. It's important to note that these promising yet underdeveloped elements were revisited at a later date, as this adventure began a Vecna trilogy of sorts. It was followed up by Vecna Reborn and Die, Vecna, Die. These sequels were written by different writers, but they picked up on plot threads left lingering in this adventure. 
Vecna Lives is, in our opinion, the worst of the three, but it at least establishes Vecna as a properly menacing character, seeding great things for the future. Ultimately, Vecna Lives has a lot of interesting ideas, but is inherently flawed in its premise, using AD&D as a clunky vehicle for its horror story. That's not to say it's inherently wrong to combine horror with D&D, check out our video on Ravenloft to see how it's masterfully accomplished, but the problem lies in trying to enforce scripted scenes that are better suited for cinema. AD&D is more of a simulationist rule set where the DM sets the stage, enlisting the players as actors and treating the story as organic improv, letting the dice fall where they may. Movies, on the other hand, routinely rely on narrative convenience, plot armor, and contrived fakeouts, something not often found in a typical D&D adventure, provided your DM doesn't fudge the rules too much. While this can still make for an interesting story, Vecna Lives leans too often on this mentality, demanding pivotal events play out in an inflexible way. It transforms the colorful stage into a controlled set, dropping a script into the hands of the players and telling them to remember their lines or get out. 